Assalamualaikum and hi everyone. Welcome to the Sharda Effect podcast. I'm Sharda, your host. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. We are now on episode 10 with the topic Comfort Women, Their Eternal Voices. Hmm, intriguing, right? Well, sit tight while we listen to Miss Stephanie Lee, the Program Director of Comfort Women Action for Redress and Education Care. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Shaida. Stephanie, let's heat up the engine first before we start. Um, I conducted a quick poll on my Instagram. Um, the question being, have you ever heard of Comfort Women before? Uh, with a yes or no option for uh, an answer. And the result shows that um, the majority of the people, around 77% voted no. So um, it seems that the majority is actually um, unaware about the issue on comfort women, which is, um, you know, but I'm actually quite pleased that a number of them um, messaged me and expressing their interest to know more about um, comfort women. So this is very important here, what you're about to share with all of us, Stephanie. Yeah. Uh, that's great. And that's a, such a good idea to conduct a poll just to get a sense of the audience. Mm -hmm. So um, can you share a bit about the organization Comfort Women Action for Redress and Education Care? Yes, we are a Los Angeles based organization, uh, but we have recently been working out of Seoul, South Korea as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we are led by Phyllis Kim, who's our executive director. And initially, we the organization was called um, KASC, which stands for Korean American Form of California, mm -hmm. and it was it began to form support around a U.S. congressional resolution mm -hmm. that was passed in 2007, and this resolution uh, was basically called upon the Japanese government to take unequivocal responsibility for comfort women. So after the resolution passed, I think the Phyllis and the other members of the group quickly realized that the Japanese government was going to continue its campaign to distort history and to uh, continue denying that comfort women had been military sexual slaves. So since then, the organization has gone on to work on educational projects, um, particularly focused in Los Angeles and California. Um, in 2012, 2013, uh, we uh, installed a comfort woman memorial mm -hmm. that is a replica of one that is, was initially installed in front of the Japanese embassy in Seoul. And uh, we have just been continuing on with this mission of educating, particularly the younger generation. And we are currently working with one of the last survivors, 93-year-old Young Su, to try and bring this issue to an international court. I see. So um, how does your role as the program director um, uh, you know, contribute in this um, organization? I initially just began helping with projects here and there. When our executive director, Phyllis, moved to Seoul um, mm -hmm. recently, it just was a natural progression to me, to my helping out with more projects and beginning to uh, plan and develop programs in advance because actually there has been a lot of growing interest in our work and it's con we work with different organizations and have advisors uh, who weigh in on different direct the directions we can take and different projects that would really have the most impact. I see. So let's move on to the very, very important question. What is, what is a comfort woman? What exactly are their job scopes? You know. Sure. So, comfort woman is a is a historical term. Mm -hmm. Was used by the Japanese military to refer to a particular institution um, in which women and children, women and girls particularly, were trafficked from wherever the Japanese Imperial Army. Um, expanded to, occupied, or colonized 
not just during the later years of World War II, but actually the system of trafficking and enslavement existed approximately between 1932 to 1945 when the Japanese military, Japan's government surrendered. And it, the term comfort woman is often described as a euphemism mm -hmm. because it doesn't really capture what the women and children went through once yeah. they were in comfort stations. Um, the Japanese military believed, had several reasons for setting up these facilities and uh, they were basically places where the victims were subjected to um, serial rape, to mass rape. Um, many of them were also forced to undergo medical procedures without consent, including sterilization, abortion, hysterectomies, um, and they also became pregnant against their will. And so a lot of them during their captivity in comfort stations also witnessed other victims you know, being tortured um, and imprisoned in brutal conditions. So that is, um, that is why the term comfort woman is often used in quotations or with some other way of noting that it's, it's a imposed term on the victims um, and that the victims don't necessarily accept that term for themselves. I see. So it's not them who label themselves as comfort women, but it's the, um, the Japanese soldiers themselves? Yes, that was the term that they used in military documents. Mm. There were also in certain countries, the Japanese military would run a recruiting system and place advertisements uh, for local traffickers or recruiters to round up these women and girls. Um, and they, some of those may have used the term comfort woman, but to the average average girl or woman um, in, in a, any given country, they wouldn't, even if they saw that term, they wouldn't have known what it meant. Uh, later on, as the history became known, um, this became, the term comfort woman became the phrase by which this historical institution was recognized. Um, and so I think people today understand all the different layers of this particular term. Yeah, because when you hear comfort, right, it's like comfort is supposed to be like, um, you know, something that is comfortable to you. So it really contradicts to that comfort women. So, um, yeah. And how, I think, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was going to say many of the survivors themselves have actually spoken specifically on this on this word mm -hmm. and rejected the term comfort woman. They one of them, one of the Dutch survivors, General Verhern, said that she completely um, disagrees with all of the connotations because it means warm and soft, mm -hmm. but she was actually a Japanese war rape victim. Yeah. Um, so, um, how would, like, uh, uh, this these comfort women like um, they were taken during the Japanese occupation right like how uh, the Japanese construct the system like why is it um, why does it exist in the first place mm -hmm. yeah. um, the system I think a lot of historians have uh, related the system back to a um, basically a network of prostitution that existed in Japan, mm -hmm. um, the Karayuki-san system. Uh, this system was also quite problematic because it particularly targeted um, girls and women from impoverished backgrounds. So they weren't really in a position where they fully understood what their this work would involve. And they were under overwhelming pressure because of poverty. And many of the researchers who have you know, studied the system, um, for example, um, Tomoko Yamazaki, uh, acknowledge that these pressures create an environment where 
Japanese women and girls were victimized as well. Um, the, the, an additional problem existed with, this, with that particular system, which was that it was illegal under international law to then traffic women and girls outside of Japan mm -hmm. under various international treaties that existed at the time. And so even if you were a kayuki san you would have to be smuggled um, illegally to different countries. The development into, and then at some, there was a decision made by the Japanese military um, that it, for various reasons, some of them being that there weren't enough existing Japanese sex workers, and also they had they were beginning to expand territorially across such a vast region mm -hmm. that um, they, this existing system, and they were also aware of the international law implications that this the karaoke san system could not continue, and so they made a decision that they would begin to recruit and traffic girls from all the occupied and colonized regions, um, and this is what became known as the comfort woman system, and it. The development of the system sort of tracks the Jap expansion of the Japanese empire across the region. So beginning in the 1930s, it's mostly limited to Taiwan and Korea, which were already colonies of Japan. So it, that really facilitated the trafficking and recruitment of women and girls. Um, a, many historians look at the rape of Nanking, the Nanking massacre in 19. Um, 37 as a catalyst for widely expanding the comfort woman system because the atrocities at Nanking became internationally known and it caused the Japanese empire a lot of embarrassment. So they decided that to try and control the soldiers' behavior and also to protect the soldiers' health um, and limit rebellion locally um, as well as prevent war se military secrets from linking they would create, they would invest a lot more into expanding the system of where basically women and girls could still be raped, but without such international visibility. And then when you get to 1941, which is the bombing of Pearl Harbor, um, that is when the Japanese Imperial military began expanding even more beyond China throughout Southeast Asia. And I believe they, um, invaded Malaysia just prior to Pearl Harbor. And so that is really when the system expanded to um, countries as far as India, um, Singapore, Malaysia, of course, Indonesia, and then even westward into the South Pacific. That is absolutely horrible. I'm just uh, sitting here and listening to you and just wondering why is it not, you know, like it's not exactly written clearly in history textbooks like mm -hmm. most of us in Malaysia are not exactly aware of that you know it's just really saddening I don't know um yeah yeah it, and, it is it is and it, I think it's a it's a shock when people learn about it for the first time because it's such a massive part of the second world war and it, the, it, the development of what happened and why it took so long for survivors to come forward has such poignancy and resonance, I think, for how we understand sexual violence today. Yeah, that's we absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, hmm, go ahead. I, I've read this before, like before um, we're having this um, discussion, but I'm still in shock each time I hear about it because it's just so horrifying and so so the Japanese like um, the, the uh, before they used prostitution inside their own country first right but mm -hmm. as their um, empire expand they start to recruit girls unwillingly um, mm -hmm. to serve their soldiers soldiers mm -hmm. but um, the irony is they want to appease their soldiers and also curb that sexual diseases, but they don't exactly care about the, the girls and women's welfare. It's, I think that's, yeah, that's exactly yeah. the point. Um, just the just by looking at 
the military justifications for the system, it becomes very clear that the woman, the comfort woman, were objectified. They mm -hmm. weren't viewed as humans. Their humanity and individuality wasn't taken into account. They were purely there just to service the soldiers. And um, historians, including uh, a very famous Japanese historian Yoshimi Yoshiaki mm -hmm. pointed out that the really fatal flaw in the system is that there was no way it could actually help to mitigate sexual violence, which was a lot of the planned and spontaneous rape that Japanese soldiers would commit, even outside of the conversations. Because in the conversations, the same violence was occurring as was happening outside the stations. So there was no it was based on the same violence that it was trying to prevent. There was an inherently contradictory purpose and justification for the system. I wonder if the women in the comfort stations are allowed to communicate with each other or even have like outings or were they not allowed to? Yeah, I mean, it is, it is also important to recognize that there was a range of situations within the comfort woman system. Uh, many survivors did say that they weren't allowed to sleep with other people um, in their particular station or facility, uh, partly because I think there was a concern that they would collaborate and try to escape. Um, there were, yeah, there were other stations where there may have been more flexibility and uh, some of the women were allowed to go on brief outings, um, sometimes even you know, in, in stations that were run under a facade mm -hmm. of, of sex work, of prostitution, paid sex work, um, mm -hmm. they, some of those victims may have uh, been able to go out and go shopping, um, to visit with the local community. But I think the important thing to remember is who controlled those types of situations and were they free to leave? If you're only free to leave to go out for you know three hours in a day, even if you can go buy something, buy something nice to wear, but you have to go back to the station and you don't really have a way of communicating with outside world or traveling back to your homeland, that isn't a situation of freedom. That's not a situation of a really willing and informed consent. Um, yeah. You know. Absolutely. So to clear the confusion once and for all for other listeners out there, perhaps, is comfort women a form of sexual enslavement or voluntary prostitution? Comfort women, there is near unanimous agreement that comfort women, the comfort woman system refers to military sexual slavery. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that question is very timely because in the international academic community, there's been a lot of um, controversy by a, a Harvard Law professor named Mark Ramsire and some others um, who have taken the position that these comfort women agreed voluntarily to, to be prostitutes or sex workers. But um, again, I think we have to go back to um, did these women and children, were they, did they give full and informed consent? That they were the ones who were, and many, many victims, especially throughout Southeast Asia, were just taken by outright force. They were abducted or kidnapped. Um, but even those victims who were taken through recruitment or trafficking, were they really told about the, what work they would have to do were they told about how many men they would have to um, serve. serve Yeah, every day? Were they given the chance to leave? Even if they agreed to be sex workers, did they agree to undergo med other medical procedures like pregnancy or like uh, sterilization or having their uterus removed? So it's very difficult to make the argument that they had this free and full agency and power to um, consent to this kind of work. So um, you see, 
is there since it's like we um there's that and then do you think there's some kind of hierarchy within the comfort women system like some women might be treated as you know um like a mistress instead of like a sexual slave do you think yeah i there was there were different power dynamics within comfort stations some of them were run by former karaoke san um mm -hmm. so some of these you know other sex workers would be managing other sexual slaves um and maybe they were also victimized themselves because mm -hmm. what led them to having to take on those responsibilities um but within the and then within the comfort stations which were regulated and managed by the Japanese military there were also different rates set different um prices for you know comfort women who are Japanese or ethnically Japanese for example um and those rates were higher than other comfort women who were for example Korean or Chinese um or Filipino um so uh it, when you know legal practitioners have looked at the system they point out that it was also discriminate there was also discrimination within the system itself and that sort of points to the overall um problematic conditions um in which these victims were were held captive can you imagine like being subjected to sexual slavery and then being discriminated due to ethnicity and also skin color that's that's horrifying so what what you know the the war ended in 1945 right mm -hmm. what what exactly are the post war realities of these comfort women like how did it affect how did it affect them after that um after after the war within the lo within the communities from which the comfort women were from it was known that this these things had happened mm -hmm. and that some women that many women had had been raped and subjected to uh inhumane conditions but you have to understand that at 1945 people don't didn't talk about rape people in some of these countries where comfort women came from you don't talk about anything that has to do with um sex or sexual assault even to your family Numbers. it's taboo right it is it's taboo and mm. even now i think there's a huge culture of victim blaming and also mm. self blaming when you uh experience this kind of uh violence so there were some survivors for example Jennifer Hearn who I mentioned who tried to talk about it with her mother but her mother couldn't handle it so she just didn't speak about it again and then there was other there was another Korean survivor named Kim Bok-dong who her mother did she didn't feel that she was worthy of being married and her mother asked her why don't you get married and she just told her at that point and she blamed herself forever afterwards because she thought the pain of it hurt her mother so much um there was also an Australian nurse Vivian Bolwinkel who was a was not in the conversation but had been raped by Japanese forces um and she actually reported it to the authorities but they decided not to prosecute it for whatever reason and she pretty much kept that to herself until her deathbed um which was she passed away a few years ago so there's a whole i think storm of circumstances why these victims didn't talk about it they were judged in their communities as unclean and impure um there was no vocabulary there was no social support system for them to come forward and for them to heal or work through the trauma that they had been um and they couldn't even talk about it with their families so i think given the time and era in which they were living it actually isn't that surprising that it took them so long uh, to come to begin coming forward which was happened in the late 19 in the 1990s 
they are very strong people, very strong women. Yeah. 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 I, how how can they keep all that inside until until now? Like that's just amazing. Like the the comfort women that you spoke to, um what kind of things that they tell you uh, uh, regarding their situation? Um I've I've only directly spoken to two, two Korean survivors. Um, one is Yeo Sun and the other is Yeo Su. And we also call them Haimani, which means grandmother, um, just mm -hmm. as a term of fem respect. Um, I think, I really think it depends. The, what the survivors say kind of depends on who they are and mm -hmm. what they're comfortable sharing. In, for some of the Korean survivors, it's very difficult still for them to talk uh, bluntly about what they went through. They'll refer to it sort of in um, in euphemisms as well, because they're still from a culture where you don't really talk about these things, and that's a very hard habit to break. Yeah. Um, there, if you watch. Uh, testimonies of survivors from other countries, for example, the Philippines, they're still very guarded, but they might, you know, they'll still say, for example, I was used, the soldiers used me. Um, and so I think that for anyone who comes across any survivor or victim of sexual violence, um, you know, there's always, we always have to be careful and sensitive to how we talk about it with them and um, what what they're comfortable with in terms of sharing. I see. So how do we actually um, identify a survivor? Um, because some of them are reluctant to share their experience, right? How, mm -hmm. how exactly, yeah. How, well, I think that since, since the 1990s, when the survivors began coming forward, many of them made an affirmative decision to begin telling their test their stories and begin giving testimony. Um, so that was actually an act of empowerment for many of them. Uh, other survivors um, really preferred to stay in the shadows and didn't want to come forward. Um, so I don't think we, I think for the ones who have made the decision that their testimony is important, they've, we given a signal that this is something that they want to talk about. But we also have to remember that there's actually, there's probably very many survivors who never came forward and who will never know about because they made a decision that they didn't that this was the best thing for them. So um, these atrocities happened a long time ago, but there are still people who are skeptical about this issue because they didn't, I don't know, maybe because they, they don't believe in the, the evidences that we have, like the survivors. Um, and also they are saying, why now? Why can't we just let the past remain in the past? And they also question, are we blaming the current generation when it's the essence, it is the ancestors that did that to the comfort women? And mm -hmm. I, I just want to know how and why is it important that these women's struggles for justice should be made known and publicly? Yeah, yeah I think there's a, there's a lot of reasons. And the, it's also important to remember that um, current Japanese generations today Mm -hmm. are not responsible for the crimes that their ancestors committed. This isn't really about holding Japanese uh, individuals or citizens responsible. This is about governmental responsibility by the Japanese government for the acts that it committed as part of wartime and military strategy. Um, and that is actually a big reason why we should keep remembering this history and not forget about justice for these survivors. When they came forward, they actually ended up influencing uh, international legal 
procedures today, their testimonies were part of the reason for why sexual slavery, rape, um, forced pregnancy, and sterilization, uh, and a term called um, enforced prostitution, uh, were criminalized under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Um, so if they hadn't come forward, these changes in the law and recognition of these crimes might not have developed in the way they did. Um, another reason that we, I think, we should continue remembering the history um, and trying to seek the Japanese government's account accountability is because it sets a very bad precedent if any government can commit this level of atrocity and then still get away with not recognizing the facts or trying to distort the facts or insisting that it didn't occur because that just invites other perpetrators, other countries, other organizations from committing the same crimes um, because there's no disincentive um, so it, and I think another reason is that, again, like we said, it's such a big part of the Second World War. It's our mm -hmm. part of our collective world history. Um, a lot of times people think of comfort women and they think of the Korean and Chinese victims, but we have to remember that they came from more than 13 countries, including Malaysia, um, again, all the way to India, all the way across the Pacific Ocean. It would actually be really, really strange if we didn't remember it, the yeah. black hole in our history. Um, and these are victims, these are events that often get left out of the official records. But they, they happened all the same. Um, and we finally have maybe a, an environment where survivors can start to talk about them. Mm -hmm. So has the Japanese government responded to um, this calling to the women's, the comfort women's justice? Um, they have res they have responded in very flip flopping ways. Mm -hmm. Initially, I mean, <laughs> it's really a thirty year history of the Japanese government trying to decide what to, how to respond and not quite succeeding in a consistent or really acceptable way. Um, initially, when the survivors first began coming forward, the Japanese government denied responsibility and involvement. And it was only until the Japanese historian Yoshimi Shiki published records in a Japanese newspaper that the government finally admitted that the military was involved. And in 1993, um, the chief cabinet secretary, Yohei Kono, issued a unmarked statement where he admitted that the military was involved. Um, he did focus heavily on victims from Korea, but he also made um, the statement that they would, you know, I'm paraphrasing a bit here, but they would um, forever engrave the history um, through the study and teaching of history through the study and teaching um, of, of the facts um, so that it would not happen again. The problem is that it, the Japanese government still hasn't, and there have been other, there have been some reparations measures taken. Uh, the Japanese government was part of a commingled private fund essentially where um, they paid out settlements to survivors. Many of the survivors ended up rejecting them because it didn't come with the level of apology and acknowledgement that they were mm -hmm. um, But it's not, that's not to say that monetary reparations don't matter. They, especially if you're immediate, coming immediately out of that situation, you probably need help and access to resources. But this history is something that didn't get known until 50 years later. So at that point, it was more about acknowledgement and teaching the history going forward. Um, there was also a deal struck, or it was, it was actually a press announcement. It was a press conference that was held in 2015 between the South Korean and Japanese government. And the Japanese government ended up paying 
um, significant monetary reparations. But the other terms of the agreement, which were that you know, the governments would not criticize each other and this was a final and irreversible solution, those kinds of terms are very problematic because there isn't really a, ever a really a final solution for this kind of sexual violence. And even just two months after that, that announced press conference, the Japanese government then went on the record saying there's no evidence that the victims were forcibly taken. So I think that although the Japanese government has made these gestures of um, partial gestures of acknowledgement, the overwhelming impact of their actions, which is that they say there's no evidence, um, they continue that the victims were coerced or forcibly taken. They have actively lobbied against memorials to the victims around the world. Um, and they oppose and condemn efforts to teach the history, which is actually what they promised to do in 1993 in the Kono Statement, only lead to one conclusion, which is that the Japanese government hasn't taken unequip unequivocal responsibility for the comfort system. I see. Yeah, I can see it's very flip-floppy indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I did try to read up on um, what the Japanese government might have done to address the issue, but yeah, I couldn't exactly find like a specific um, address. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there have been a series of statements. Um, the Kona statement is probably the most well known. There have been a few others, um, but again, I think what is the work? What we have to, from a survivor's perspective, if you have experienced these things. And if the, the perpetrator state or government says, yes, this happened to you and we will teach it forever in the history, but then turns around and actually actively tries to remove the history from its educational materials and programs and then goes around the world paying money to try and make other countries not remember it. It's, it's going to be a very, it's, it's a very inconsistent position to take. <laughs> yeah. There are roughly how many comfort women survivors are out there left? And, um, and what, are, what are the situations now? Well, I think an, a rough estimate would be maybe 100 survivors today. Um, there are, of the known survivors, there are 14 registered survivors in South Korea. Uh, there are two, I think, I believe two in Taiwan. There's about a little bit more than a dozen in China and probably an estimated maybe like 50 to 90 in the Philippines. So give or take maybe slightly over 100, um, 120 at the outside. And their situations really vary from country to country in, in South Korea because the issue has become well known. Many of the survivors um, do have a support system. Um, they have helpers or they have organizations that support them. Um, in, in China and Taiwan, I believe there there is, I don't know if there's government support, but there is community support and there aren't many survivors left. In the Philippines, um, I think mostly they are not supported by the government. Their families have um, tried to care for them the best they, they can. And um, that's also another important point because even on the one hand, there's the issue of holding the Japanese government, government responsible. But also if you're a survivor, your own government should make to take steps to support and recognize your claims as well. So um, how can the listeners, the general public, you mm -hmm. know, um, help give support to the remaining survivors? Like mm -hmm. what can we help to do? Yeah, there's, there's, there are a whole range of things that people can do and they don't, you don't have to be from 
a country with um, that was occupied or colonized during World War II. And this is an issue that is really a human rights issue and a women's rights issue. And Absolutely. how we handle it really impacts how we treat and uh, support other women and children and men going, having to suffer similar things today. Um, so some of the act, you know, one of the first things we think that especially younger generations can do is just learn the history, remember the history. Um, it's not a passive act if you learn it and pass it on to others. Uh, now we have social media, so if you see something about it on social media, you know, share it. Um, we, a, a lot of the students that we meet have decided on their own to study or write a paper or do a project on it, and they bring it up to their own teachers or their own representatives. And it's really important for others in the community to see that there's that ground level grassroots interest because especially you know if you have a political representative that representative is supposed to represent supposed to speak up for you so that makes an impact as well um we have some campaigns going on um again the first most important one is this campaign for young so um mm -hmm. and we're trying to support her uh the appeal to take these issues to the international court of justice which is the United Nations highest tribunal. Um, and we have petitions that we've linked to in our website uh, and our social media profiles if people want to sign and show interest there. And the important thing to remember about a case like that is that um, because the, the full historical record of the comfort woman system can be presented, it would cover the situations of all the victims from different countries because it was a multinational institution. So although this particular case could be would be limited to South Korea and Japan, um, the underlying facts are relevant to the much larger um, history. Um, I think those are yeah those are some of the ways that people can start um, getting involved. And I think another sort of thing that I've realized is when you start seeking out these ways to learn and connect with others who are interested, it kind of just naturally grows into a network and community um, of support. But recently, we have been keeping in touch with some of the volunteers in the Philippines who um, you know, keep company with the Lolas, with the grandmothers there. And one of them had just told me, messaged that uh, one of, two of the Lolas had recently passed away and they weren't even able to tell another one because they didn't want her to feel sad about it. And we just overnight put together a Google form so that people could write and send messages. And two photographers in the Philippines who have done stories on the Lolas and Hannah Reyes Morales and Jimmy Domingo, they immediately responded and spread the word to their own followers and networks. And that just happened really spontaneously. So it's those kinds of things um, that you don't really expect and then just end up working out in a really humbling way. Social media works really fast, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's always, it's a, I mean, yeah, <laughs> and I think especially when you run any kind of social media campaign for an issue like this, you do want to be really careful because the issues are so tough and nuanced, but at the same time, I think people are interested and they want to learn more, and this is just a very available way for them to learn about it. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> I think uh, th that's how I found out about Comfort Women too. Actually, I was um, I was watching this video by Asian Boss. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah the, uh, on the um, Madam Kim. Mm -hmm. I don't remember her full name. Yes. Yeah, and I was like horrified when I first watched it I, because I didn't 
I didn't know at all about it. And then after I did, because I was interested in the topic, so I did more research um, uh, online. And I found out it, it actually doesn't just happen to Koreans and Japanese. It also happens to other women from other countries, such as Malaysians too. And I was like, what? <laughs> I didn't know that. And it's, yeah, and it sparked this um, me reaching out to care you know, just to have that um, authentic um, source for other people to know as well, because it's just not out there yet, I believe. Yeah. That's so good to hear. Yes, that video, that interview is with Kim Mok Dong Harmony, who is a very um, cherished, one of the you know very cherished survivors in South Korea. And absolutely, it is it is part of Malaysian history. Um, one of the big sort of milestones in the comfort women movement was a people's tribunal that was held in Tokyo in the year 2000. And that's where survivors from, uh, I think, nine countries in total came forward. And one of the survivors was Malaysian. Her name was Rosalind Sa. And mm -hmm. there are a couple of Japanese historians um, I think it's Hayashi Hirofumi and then Nakahara Michiko who have focused their studies on comfort women from Southeast Asia and um, I know that Professor Nakahara interviewed uh, Rosalind Sa and she has a video testimony that um, the researchers have uploaded to YouTube so you can see it there and it, it is you know, I think there was political pressure uh, back in the 90s, which prevented the Malaysian government from putting forth the claims of their survivors. And we just, that yeah. just kind of brings it back to all the complications that politicizing the issue brings and, you know, what happens if the government doesn't speak up for its survivors. But even so, we can all take make efforts to remember the history. And um, I, I think that it's pretty natural for us to want to learn more. Um, you may not know that, have known that there were Malaysian comfort women, but you probably knew that the Japanese occupied Malaysia during World War II. Yeah. I, that's what I knew about, you know, from my own relatives. And if you get taught that, you know, for example, if you have relatives who are forced to learn a different language, or if they taught you to be careful around policemen or men in uniform, or um, they have taught you certain behaviors that relate back to how they grew up, you kind of just want to learn more and understand why. There's nothing yeah. weird about that. <laughs> okay. I also sometimes listen to my uh, grandmother's stories, um, but she was too young at that time during the Japanese occupation, but she told me stories that girls usually had to like dress up as boys mm -hmm. and they would have to darken their skin because the Japanese prefer uh, uh, fair-skinned women. Yeah. And, I, I, and I was like sitting there wondering, you know, like, why? <laughs> yeah, but but when, I, um, when I learned about comfort women, oh, that's why. <laughs> that is, I think that yeah. happens so often. Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, there's a, there's another video series I think called The Last Survivors by Rage Star, which I think is a Malaysian media network. But they do an interview with a um, a lady named Ethlyn Tail, I think. Mm -hmm. and she talks about how she had to cut off her hair and hide, like you know, masquerade as a boy because she didn't want to be taken. She didn't want to be um, subjected to sexual assault. There's also another artist in the UK named Jai Ho and she grew up with similar family stories as well. So uh, yeah, it it's, feels um, affirming when you start looking to the stories and you're like, oh, that's why, and you make the connections together and you see that others yeah. have grown up with similar stories. Okay, final question. Mm -hmm. How can others emulate the organization in terms of like raising awareness and also taking actions? I, I think like some of the, what we were just talking about is actually a very natural, natural way to um, begin raising awareness, 
in your own local communities, which is uh, just reach out, you know, it's go ahead and feel free to do your own projects, to do your own school projects um, and show that your teachers or your professors that you have interest. Um, if you, I think that you'll find that if you do that, you're going to find other people around you who want to do the same thing. And, you know, it's every, in terms of more political or legal action, it really just depends on each community and each country. Um, but like I said, there's nothing stopping you from reading or learning or just sharing the knowledge on your own. Um, and that, you know, if you find enough people to support each other and, and grow the movement, then you may be able to find, may be able to create a path towards something larger, whether it's putting up a memorial or asking your schools uh, to begin learning the history. Um, I, something that I think I've learned is that uh, no one can change everything, but everyone can ch try to change at least one thing. And if you're a lot of people together trying to change one thing, you can probably get something something done. And it's, I really didn't expect to think about things like that when I just started helping on projects here and there. But um, I, so it's, this lesson has just been a very genuine, genuine one. Um, and I think it's so great to see people like yourself uh, show interest and do this thing which you're doing which is hosting a podcast about the subject and taking a poll and um, you know sharing it with people so it just starts with small things like this thank you so much for your time today Stephanie it was absolutely very very insightful and I'm sure many of us think the same way and hopefully there will be like more awareness activities among our listeners and my hope is that these harmony stories won't be forgotten even for the next generations. And I think more awareness can be raised by sparking discussions like we are having right now. Um, do you have anything else that you would like to uh, convey to our listeners? Um, I just thank you, Shaira, for your um, foresight in um, reaching out and just taking a leap of faith and uh, engaging with the subject we please feel free to reach out anytime and for the listeners out there please reach out to us we actually this is the most maybe rewarding part of what we do um, so i just yeah i really want to encourage um, everyone to don't find your tribe find your tribe and of interested people and just don't hold back awesome so to bolster this awareness, um, a write-up is on its way along with the release of this podcast and I will attach it along with the episode's list of resources. So if you guys out there has, um, have access to other resources, do let us know maybe in the comments below so others can check it out. Now, a little bit about the history of Malayan comfort women. There is little known about the Malayan Jugun Yanfu comfort women as there is still a lack of research and documentation. Many blog posts that I have come across can only conclude with hope that this tragedy would not occur again in the future. Some elderlies address these women as wanita penghibur and some simpanan Jepun. Only those who lived in that era would know the true story. The issue feels as though it is being sweeped under a rug but is it possible that these women were reluctant to share their stories due to dignity? It is appalling that the comfort women issue was never covered in our history syllabus in Malaysia, and these women were only mentioned as quote-unquote prisoners. Nothing more is elaborated. There was only one research paper that I can rely on as I searched for evidences by Professor Nakahara Michiko and another by Hirofumi Hayashi and there was only one legitimate testimony of Rosalind Saw. In Professor Michiko's paper, she detailed evidences of comfort stations in Malaysia, such as in Hotel Abanglo, and quoting her paper, 
Many old Singaporeans and Malaysians remember that the scenery of everyday life in their towns and villages during the occupation included comfort stations. For example, in Kuala Lumpur, there were these sites. Number one, a large single-story brick bungalow with a tile roof behind the Chinese assembly hall. Two, four large buildings along Jalan Gurni or Pekaliling, now Tun Raza, next to the National Library. Three, the Taishan Hotel opposite the Pudu Jail. And fourth, a large house along Jalan Ampang. And this one, this comfort station here, was used by high-ranking Japanese soldiers. Clement Liang, who specializes in Japanese war history in Malaya, said the government was especially focused on developing the country in the 90s and played down the issue of comfort women for the sake of good relations with Japan. It has been more than eight years since then, but Liang thinks the silence from Malaysia is not right. He said, it is true that that part of history is over, but we must never forget that it happened. It is an example of how women are always the worst victims of war. Only a small portion of this horrific event is mentioned in Ling's journal article, which quotes other article. And I would like to stress again that this shows the lack of academic study and also awareness on Malayan comfort women in our country, or even comfort women in general. Not many people know about these women. Certain political parties, namely AMNO and MCA, did try to bring the issue to light in the 1990s, but failed. I will now read an excerpt from Professor Michiko's paper. The issue of Japanese military sex slavery or the Japanese military comfort women system emerged publicly in Malaysia with the return of Mustafa Yaakob, Secretary of AMNO Youth, the youth division of the government party AMNO, or United Malays National Organization, from Kathmandu, Nepal, in October 1992. He had attended the conference of the International Investigation Committee on the Crimes of War of Japan, which was held in Kathmandu on 16 to 17 October 1992. Committee members were from France, Algeria, Japan, Thailand, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Malaysia. Mustafa Yaakob took responsibility for collecting information on Japanese war crimes against the people in Malaysia during the Japanese occupation in 1942 to 1945. Immediately upon his return, Mustafa Yaakob called for the victims of the cruel deeds that occurred under the Japanese military administration to speak out. He proposed making a report based on this tes testimony to the UN World Human Rights Conference that was set to open in Vienna, Austria in May 1993, in hopes that the UN Human Rights Commission might take statements from countries in Asia that had suffered at the hands of the Japanese militarism and demand apologies and compensation from the Japanese government. Forced labor and the work of military comfort women were two examples he cited of cruel deeds. Within four months of his appeal, Mustafa Yaakub relates that he received letters from 3,500 people. The reason for this large number was the fact that it was an AMNO youth official who had issued the call. The people believed the government had finally decided to tackle the problem and demand an apology and compensation from the Japanese government. For the first time since the end of the war, the older generation had begun to speak out. After suppressing their feelings for more than half a century, they finally started writing about the experiences they had long kept secret. And among the people who were who wrote were five former Japanese military comfort women. And in addition, the MCA, Malaysian Chinese Association, another government party, also began to appeal to the victims. Michael Chong, an officer of MCA, received letters from three additional women. In all, four Malay women and four Chinese women have been recognized as former comfort women. Accordingly, Mustafa Yaakob made plans to submit his report on survivors of Japanese atrocities at international non-governmental meetings as a private person, not as a representative of AMNO youth, 
but Najib Tun Razak, the head of UMNO Youth, ordered him not to attend the human rights conference in Geneva that June. There must be a solid reason why Najib Razak, who was Minister of Defence at that time, prevented Mustafa Yaakob from exposing the 3,500 letters that he received from the Malayan comfort women. Hence, our Malayan comfort women stories were never brought to light. Meanwhile, former comfort women from other countries, such as the Philippines and Korea, are standing up to fight for this injustice until today. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Shaira Effect Podcast episode 10. So what do you think? Let us know in the comment section down below. Don't forget to like, comment, and also subscribe. See you in the next one, inshallah. Goodbye.